I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. This is a place where we hear God speak, make 11th hour decisions. Amen. And it's sometimes it's the 11th hour decisions that make all the difference. And uh, mostly every time. You know, I remember being up at Biltmore in uh, North Carolina looking at at some of the history of George Vanderbilt and all at 26 years old, you know, he built that huge, that vision he had was just off the chart. And especially that young man, and he's thirsted and hungered for knowledge. And uh, he had books of thousands and thousands and thousands in his personal library. And I think they said he had read them all. And he would order them in the first edition with no covers so that he could bind them in Moroccan leather and so they would last forever. And so built that the largest residential home in America. All the Pisgah National Forest came from his land and so forth. And he, he really did some amazing things. But one thing that really got me was I was thinking about him living in the time of the Titanic. And I went through his museum and they had these different writings about it. And I was wondering about the Titanic and why he wasn't on it and this and that or whatever I was trying to think of in my mind about that. And then I saw this letter written by his wife's sister, I think it was. And she said, we were booked on the Titanic. And then in the 11th hour, we made an 11th hour decision. I had a premonition not to go. and had an ele- made an 11th hour decision and we took another passage. And the person that went ahead of them with their luggage, he died on the And so think about that. So with all the vision, now you know how that vision, such a phenomenal place, was built. They had prophetic insight, whether they knew what it was or not. And so they were making 11th hour decisions. And God does that for us. He gives us choices, and he'll even come at the 11th hour, the last possible moment for you to make a decision. Sometimes it just takes sheer nerve, and you have to just not say, well, you know, it don't make sense. Sometimes 11th hour decisions are made without any practical knowledge. Just know something. Just have to do. Then later you find out what it was about. Amen. I was asking the team, do we have a way to put up the message translation? But we do, we do not. Um, I'd like to look at Judges 19, first of all. Somebody pull it up on their phone for a minute, too. And uh, then we're going to look at it, the King James, I think. This is a very special 11th hour today, and it's a warning day. And I, I, don't, oh, I, I don't cherish and relish giving warnings, but the prophet, you have to at times. Now, I want to, um, I want to read this in the message translation, and I want you to listen to this really close. It says, it was an era when there was no king in Israel, a Levite living as a stranger in the backwoods hill country of Ephraim got himself a concubine, a woman from Bethlehem in Judah. But she quarreled with him and left, returning to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there four months. Then her husband decided to go after her and try to win her back. He had a servant and a pair of donkeys with him. When he arrived at her father's house, the girl's father saw him, welcomed him, and made him feel at home. His father-in-law, the girl's father, pressed him to stay. He stayed with him three days, then feasted and drank and slept. On the fourth day, they got up at the crack of dawn and got ready to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen yourself with a hearty breakfast, and then you can go. So they sat down and ate breakfast together. The girl's father said to the man, come now, be my guest, stay the night, make it a holiday. The man got up to go. But his father-in-law kept after him, and so he ended up spending another night. On the fifth day, he was again up early, ready to go. 
The girl's father said, you need some breakfast. They went back and forth, and the day slipped on as they ate and drank together, but the man and his concubine were finally ready to go. Then his father-in-law, the girl's father, said, look, the day's almost gone. Why not stay the night? There was very, there's very little daylight left. Stay another night and enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get an early start and set off on your, uh, off for your own place. But this time the man wasn't willing to spend another night. He got things ready, left, and went as far as Jebus or Jerusalem with his pair of saddled donkeys, his concubine <coughs> and his servant. At Jebus, Though the day was nearly gone, the servant said to his master, It's late. Let us turn into this Jebusite city and spend the night. But his master said, We're not going into any city of foreigners. We'll go on to Gibeah. He directed his servant, Keep going. Let's go on ahead, and we'll spend the night either at Gibeah or Ramah. So they kept going. As they pressed on, the sun finally left them. Uh, in the vicinity of Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They left the road there to spend the night at Gibeah. The Levite went and sat down in the town square, but no one invited them to spend the night, in to spend the night. Then late in the evening, an old man came in from his day's work in the field. He was from the hill country of Ephraim and lived temporarily in Gibeah where all the local citizens were, Benjamites. When the old man looked up and saw the traveler in the town square, he said, where are you going and where are you from? The Levite said, we're just passing through. We're coming from Bethlehem on our way to a remote spot in the hills of Ephraim. I come from there. I just made a trip to Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way back home, but no one has invited us for the night. We wouldn't be any trouble. We have food and straw for the donkeys and bread and wine for the woman, the young man, and me. We don't need anything. The old man said, it's going to be all right. I'll take care of you. You aren't going to spend the night in the town square. He took them home and fed the donkeys. They washed up and sat down to a good meal. They were relaxed and enjoying themselves when the men of the city, a gang of local hell raisers, all surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They yelled for the owner of the house, the old man, bring out the man who came to your house. We want to have sex with him. He went out and told them, no, brothers, don't be obscene. This man is my guest. Don't commit this outrage. Look, my virgin daughter and his concubine are here. I'll bring them out for you. Abuse them if you must. But don't do anything so senselessly vile to this man. But the men wouldn't listen to him. Finally, the Levite pushed his concubine out the door to them. They raped her repeatedly all night long. Just before dawn, they let her go. The woman came back and fell at the door of the house where her master was sleeping. When the sun rose, there she was. It was morning. Her master got up and opened the door to continue his journey. There she was, his concubine, crumpled in a heap at the door, her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said. Let's get going. There was no answer. He lifted her onto his donkey and set out for home. When he got home, he took a knife and dismembered his concubine, cut her into 12 pieces. He sent her piece by piece throughout the country of Israel, and he ordered the men he sent out, say to every man in Israel, has such a thing as this ever happened from the time the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until now? Think about it. Talk it over. Do something. Now this is a story that's in the Scripture. That's a true event. And it's an event that absolutely puzzles and baffles a lot of people. I want you to really listen to what's going on. In the King James, it starts this way. Judges 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, there was a certain Levite sojourning in the side of Mount Ephraim 
who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. His concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now, at this time, there was no king in Israel. And you'll find out at the end of this story that every man did what was right in his own eyes. So there was no king in Israel. There was no leader. And this certain Levite took his concubine. Now, the scripture says that this concubine, it talks about how she was, this actually means adulterer was He was in, it was someone else's wife it talks about. It says, um, it says that there was, how am I going to do that, Lord? It says that there was, it was talking about adultery. It was talking about she was an illicit partner. She, she, now remember, you have to remember, all of this happens. A Levite is someone who is called to be separated for God's use. Remember that. And this whole story, remember, it, it did not happen in the land of strangers. They wouldn't go into a land of a stranger. This is all happening within God's people. They would have been better off to have been in the land of a stranger. But there was no leader. And so this Levite, that one separated for God's use, took himself a concubine. Now, I want you to listen to this. And I'm going to translate certain words and try my best to tell you what was going on as far as the Hebrew words that have been translated. Are you ready? The Lord said, read it in the Message Bible and then tell it this way so that it is presented to the church twice that it is presented as two witnesses. Now listen to this. Consider the following. Is it possible today that this happened? Consider the following. There was a time when there was no leader in the country. And a certain who was the who was the only one, the ones that were separated for the use of God. They began to shrink in fear on the coasts or from coast to coast. The ones who were separated for the use of God began to draw back in fear, shrink in fear from rising up in fruitfulness. And and listen what it says, and they took unto themselves adulterers, a lover, illicit partner of a married person out of the house of bread. This is happening within God's people, within the church. And their illicit partners of married persons committed adultery on them and walked away. Listen to this. It goes on in translation to talk about bestiality, and gender began to be confused in their genders. Said they got, they were on all fours like animals. They lied down like they couldn't, their, their genders were all messed up. And the words let gender comes into being. The descendant set aside for God's use went after her, claiming she was his wife. They had a warped sense of marriage. Those set aside for God's use got her and began to bring her back to the same life they had fallen into. But they wouldn't go into another city. Legalism kept them right in religion. We'll not go to a stranger. And yet he was with a married wife. And they were gender confused. And they were living all kinds of illicit lifestyles, illicit sex lives. 
And yet when he comes back, he maintains this legality. We're turning into our own people. We're going back to the church. We won't go anywhere else. So they go into this city. And they said, let's go over here. Let's go over. We'll go to Gibeah or, 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 or uh, uh, um, and Ramah or Gaboa and Ramah, the high place where it also speaks of idols. So this could be also talking about all kinds of things, not just physical things, but spiritual adultery. And so they got this warped sense of ideas, the people that are separated for God's use. And they start marrying other men's wives. They start living in illicit sexual lifestyles. They have no checkup about them. And then gender starts to get confused around everyone. They start identifying with animals, people. Makes no difference. And this is all happening within God's people. They wouldn't go out into the world. The world is the world. But the church is something else entirely. God's people are the ones who have, are all the salt of the earth. And so he goes after her. She commits adultery on him, so he takes off after her. He gets down there to, the, to her father's house. He finally leaves. And he comes back and he says, I'm not staying in strangers. I'm, I'm going to stay among my own people. But they're, he, they're living worse than the strangers. So he gets into his own, among his own people, and he sits in the street because there was no hospitality. Nobody invited him in. And an old man represents an old generation. Hear the word of the Lord. It represents an old generation. Someone who knew different. He goes out and says, come in and stay with me. And he brings the man in with his illicit partner and his servant. And they go in and sit down to a meal. And the old man with the old ways begins to serve him a meal. But suddenly, inside God's people, they surround his house and they start beating on the house. And they say, send this man out here that we can have sex with this man. The men of the city going around the house. And the old man says, why do you want to do such a horrible thing? Why don't you take the women? In other words, the woman and the man is the natural use. But you want to have sex with another man. He said, don't do such a depraved thing. Yet they beat on the door. And so the man stands up and takes his illicit partner that he claims as his wife, which was somebody else's, shoves her out into the crowd and closes the door and goes to bed. They abuse the woman all night long. All night. And as the dawn started to break, they turned her loose. And she stumbled and staggered back to the old man's house. And the scripture says she fell down with her hands on the threshold of the door. Her blood was on the threshold of the old door, trying to get in. But the generation that was set aside for God's use, who had a warped sense of mentality, who, who, couldn't con who confused gender, who confused adultery, who, who absolutely lived any way they wanted as long as they had a religious facade around them, opened the door and looked at her and said, Get up, let's go. But there was no answer because she's dead. He loads her up. This is his grand plan. He takes her back to his house. Then he takes a knife and cuts her up in pieces, bones and all. Twelve pieces. What kind of warped sense of a person can sit there and hew them up in pieces and smell their body parts out? When he mailed them out, he stirred up a civil war 
in the inside God's people. And they almost wiped out a whole tribe. And they had to finally turn back to the women and men being married or they were going to lose a whole tribe. Could this happen today? Is it possible that such a thing could happen today? Hear the word of the Lord. You're living in a time when there is no king. You're living in a time, what you're looking at is a spirit that moves in when, when elections are confused. You're looking at a time when a spirit takes over and rises up among the ranks of depraved people. When there is no clear king, there's no king. And they rise up in this time. And God's people, it wasn't the strangers that he was talking to. The strangers wouldn't even get involved. They wouldn't go to them. Notice the story always pushes back to God's people. And it's in a time when men confused gender. They were confusing gender. In other words, it's a time when they identify with beast and people and anything they want to. You think this is new? Nay. It's a spirit that comes in when you have fraudulent leaders. And suddenly men start doing what's right in their own eyes. And they come up and surround the, the church. How could they do such a thing? Because the people that are set aside for God's use, this generation, it's not the world that defends LGBTQ. It's mostly Christians. They stand up. Love is love. Love is love. If I describe the love that you're talking about, you would be disgusted. Men start doing what's right in their own eyes as long as they have an outline of religion, as long as they have a facade of righteousness, then they think they can do anything. And then you got leaders in churches committing adultery with other men's wives inside the churches. You've got things like this going on. And then when uh, then the illicit sex going on within the church, there are some churches where they have temple prostitutes to this day that they send to guest speakers. And we stand up in this time looking around in this big pious attitude. And this pious attitude, and when this happens, we have a warped sense in the church of morality. But it's in the time of gender confusion. It's in the time when Homosexuals surrounded the old man's house, the old way, and demanded. There's nothing he could do to convince them that it's only between a man and a woman. So they abused the woman till she died. But it's not enough. Nobody repented. The man, the Levite, the man set aside for God's use, didn't open the door and say, oh, my God, what have I done? I repent before the Lord. He looked at the crumpled heap and the pitiful woman laying there, that he's the one that took her. She just followed his leadership. And he said, get up and let's be going. There was no answer. So his grand scheme, not repent. Cut her up in pieces. Start a war within the body of Christ. Start a war within Israel. Start a war within the church. Start dividing it up. And we get rainbow couples standing behind a pulpit being an anointed by whole denominations to preach. To preach. Marriage, if you define it between a man and a woman, they all start screaming and hollering, no, no. And the men that surrounded that house was not just homosexual. They must have been binary neutral or something because they wanted the man, but they raped the woman to death. This is the spirit. That, this is the spirit the church is dealing with. This is the spirit within the church. This was not a story of God's enemies. 
It was all a story of God's very own people. And it all happened within their ranks. This is where we are at today. There is no king. So when there's no king, this spirit rises. And the next thing you know, you have transgender men with stubble on their face, lipstick smeared across their mouth in high positions in political power. Standing around. You have people that are, there's not two genders anymore. It's all confused. And now there's, they identify with so many till a man can marry a moose. And you see this happening. Where is it leading to? It was designed while everybody was looking for the world to go crazy and the world to take over and the world to do these ungodly things. The whole plan of the enemy was to start a civil war within the church. Within the church. So they would wipe themselves out. Do you know what was a result of this Levite's actions? Thousands upon thousands of people died. They died. And they finally figured out, wait a minute, there's a whole tribe wiped out. Nobody's having children in Benjamin because we said we're not going to give them our, our daughters for wives and there's nobody having children. We better go back to a man and a woman. Well, how are we going to do it? He said, I'll tell you what to do. Who didn't stand up for us? Go and kill all them and take their wives and, and daughters. So they took all their virgin daughters and gave them to the Benjamites. It wasn't enough. Because homosexuality does not produce life. So they went and started taking women out of these other tribes. And then they said, there's a dance at Shiloh that happens. So when you say, hide, tell them to hide in the woods. And when they come out and start dancing in this celebration, run out there and grab them and tell them, take them back to Benjamin with them. And if their fathers and brothers get mad, we'll say, don't be mad at them. We almost had a tribe wiped out. All of this came. In the time when there was no king. You think about that. There was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. You think about it. And this is where we are today. Those days, it ends in chapter 21. You go back and read it, Judges 19 through 21. The last verse, those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own. That's what it led. And God didn't say the world. The world had been doing those things all the time. He looked at his people. Looked at his people. You have people pastoring churches. You have people standing up in churches and church leadership. And they stand behind a podium. And they condone things going on. They condone sin. They stand up. They, they don't have, they're not living as according to the word of God. It's don't offend anybody. Just don't offend people. Letting homosexuals sit in the choir and sing. Let them sit like husband and wife and live like that. Let them get behind the pulpit and stand there with their mates and think that's okay. Well, it's not okay. You're not only defiling the, the, the holy places, but you're destroying those people's any chance they have of ever coming out because you have condoned it. It started a war in the church. It started a war. The church would rather fight each other because they have a bunch of warped ideas. Warped ideas. Listen to me. It wasn't, you know, it's like the old saying was, it, it wasn't Adam and Steve in the garden. On a man, just look at a man. There's no place to receive 
It's a seed. He's a seed giver. The woman has no place to give seed. That's why the seed of the woman was the prophecy of the virgin birth. And we make this okay. And we confuse gender. Okay, let's see. There's man, uh, woman. What's one of the other ones? Let's say man, woman. Let's try it again. There's man, woman. And this is where we live. Now you wonder why such a story was in the Bible. I've heard it in the years past. Somebody said, why would such a story be recorded? It was a prophecy. The whole story was prophetic for this time because it's an exact parallel of what's happening right now. But you mark this down. God is not looking at the world. For the He's looking at his people. It's his people that are letting that happen. You're not... You're, you're defiling holy places, pastors. But you're also eliminating those people's chance of ever getting Because you've condoned everything. They have no sense of right and wrong. And you're stealing their identity. You're assisting the devil in what he does. They become, you're producing such a confused generation. They don't know who they are anymore until they grab up a rifle or something and run in and start shooting up schools. And then when someone says, it was a transgender that shot that school up, killed those three babies, killed the adults, then all of a sudden it comes on the air. Transgenders showing up with, with assault rifles saying, we'll show you no mercy. You're the ones, and this and that and the other, and, and everybody else is blamed for this. Church provided no clear leadership because there is no king in America. That's a spirit that rose out of hell when that happened. He was waiting on the day that spirit was to gain power. And now look where we are. Look where we are. People don't even think about marriage they don't think about marriage. You know how you get married now? You used to have to stand in front of a, a, a man or woman of God that, that spoke the word. So covenant vows uttered. Not now. Now you just go to a courthouse, at least here. In this state, you go to a courthouse, you get a license, that's it. That's it. All you got to do is sign the license, have it notarized, you're married. You're married, that's it. One piece of paper. church got sick. It got confused. It didn't try to come back. Now, Brother Robin, I thought you was going to preach something deep today. I thought you was going to talk about something really good today. Let me tell you something. The church is at a place. If we don't wake up right now, see what's happening a war in the church has begun that's what started the prophecy coming to pass for judges 19 now that's where it's leading and so people they don't think about marriage anymore i remember i had bible school students one time years ago and he moved in with this woman. Oh, they just gave me a place to stay, just to sit down the hall in a sleeping bag. I said, yeah, and that sleeping bag turned into an inchworm coming up the hall, didn't it, to her room. He looked at me. I said, you sleeping with that woman? Absolutely. I said, you is flaky. I said, somebody ought to be walking around behind you with a pitcher of milk and pour milk on you. You're so flaky. He said, well, we stood before God and said our vows. I said, really? 
Really, I said, God works through his body. What part of his body did you stand in front of and say your vows? Oh, he saw it, repented, got married. But now this is the kind of thing that people live in now. They identify with animals, with things. This is exactly where it was in Judges. So this was something the Lord said bring to the church today. Hear the word of the Lord. Wake up. It's not God looking at the world to fix this. It is you. It is you. Forget your new fangled ideas how to pastor. Why don't you forget that myth? Why don't you forget all this stuff about measuring parking places and multiplying feet and all to figure out how many people and this somehow brings in people to your, why don't you forget about this? People going and getting degrees and some, most of them are called to plow. They're not called to preach. They'd be better off behind a mule plowing somewhere. You need to get saved. You need to get saved. You need to do it today. You need to get saved if you're going to pastor God's people because you're going to stand in front of the Almighty for those people one of these days. You can't commit adultery in the church and say you're okay. I was involved. I remember I was <clears throat> involved in this church one time and they got me to be their minister of music and their youth pastor. And Robin and I was there and we were, you know, we were doing the. Uh, the jobs we were hired to do, the best we knew how to do it. But I, I was determined to live right before God. Everything I did, everything I do now is as, is as true as I know how to lay it on a path. I'm harder on me than I am you. So we were down there, <clears throat> and um, minister of music, youth pastor, well, their children in the youth group, I found out, was sleeping with each other out in the parking lot. So we get down there, and we, we find all this out. We start this youth program, and the kids start getting turned on to the Lord. All they had to do was hear the truth. Well, this guy who was over the youth Sunday school, I figured I was the youth pastor, and the pastor of all the youth, I should have say so, but that wasn't the way this denomination worked. He was over that Sunday school. So I find out about this stuff, and he invites me and Robin over to eat. Come and see my house. I built this house, and it was a beautiful house. I built this house. It was two or three stories. I forget. And he said, I built it, paid for it, and he was bragging on it, showing it to us. And we sat down, and, and we ate together and, and this and that, and they're talking. And then he starts taking us on the tour of this house. And he said, and, and, uh, and here is mine and my, this is our bedroom, my wife and I. And uh, right there across the hall is my ex-wife's bedroom. I said, hmm. He said, oh, yeah, I figure if a man makes a mistake, he ought to, he ought to take care of it and provide for him. And he had children broke up in those ages. And I, I looked at him. I didn't say anything. All I wanted to do was get out. So I go to the pastor. And I said, told him the whole story. I said, you know this man lives this way. Yeah, yeah, I'll handle it. I'll handle it. Well, he didn't handle it. And they, he, they let it go on for a long time because he was a huge giver. Church. That's all I can figure. Don't know that that was the reason, but I know he was a huge tither. And so, no wonder the children were sleeping together out in the parking lot of the church. This was their examples. This was the way they lived. And so, you can't, this, is, this begins to be warped, and this is a Pentecostal church. Supposed to have the power. Well, this kind of warped idea has made its way into the church. 
until now, if someone speaks out against uh, people uh, transgender or LGBTQ or something, it's the church that springs forth on sp social media and starts saying, well, my Jesus is a Jesus of love. My God's a God of love. And just forget the rest of his word altogether. I'm telling you something. This spirit waited. It waited and waited on a time there was no king. And the moment it happened, look what's taken place. Look what's happened. The moment there's no king, this happens. It waited on them. So you and your conformity churches, you and the churches that stand up and say, we don't want to offend anybody. I don't even know, I don't even know why you do what you do. People that stand up and they won't speak out against sin. They won't talk against right or wrong. I mean wrong. They won't tell what's right. We need to wake up in the church. You could do so much good right now if you just get saved. You just get saved, get born again, and start talking truth. You'd be amazed what would happen in your church. A lot of people would leave. No, you know what happened in the youth of that other church? They got turned on to God, man, and got excited. They got so excited. That didn't go well with adults because the adults didn't get as excited. So the Lord had me come on today. He said, read it out of the Message Bible. Teach it from the King James in translation of what these words mean. Tell it to the people. So now out of the mouth of two has been told. So I say to the church, and the song was the third, wake up. Wake up now. Wake up now and God will let you keep your church. Wake up now and you'll become an end-time player that will make a big difference. Wake up now. Hallelujah. And quit trying to just cut up sin and try to give it into every tribe, every body in the world. It's just causing division. Hallelujah. Well, that's all today. That's that's um it was a straightforward word and the Lord had told me this and have these pages of notes that I didn't read. I just kind of taught out of them. And um, But the Lord said, that's enough. Been out of the mouth of two or three. So I call for the church today to repent. Repent! Stand up for what's right. And you know what? Give these people that are trapped in these lifestyles Give them a chance to live. Why don't you give them a chance to live? Give them a chance to exist. Give them a chance to have children. Well, what kind of sick world? What kind of sick? Listen, I'm, I'm not talking about just the world does what the world does, but a sick mind that will take little children, take a young a young boy into an operating room, cut his penis off and make him a girl, knowing he'll die by the time he's, before he can ever make it to an old age by mutilating his body while some sick, illicit individual stands there, the man and the woman, the, the, the parents of the child, and stands there and gives their consent and smiles while it all goes on. Why don't you do it to yourself? Because you don't want that. But you get some kind of sick jolly off of watching that child do that. Heaven's not pleased. Heaven is not pleased. Ain't no reason to pretend that everything is, is honky-dory and coming up roses and while everybody just smiling and God just turns his head and goes, la, 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 while you just do everything. That's his heritage, his portion you're messing with. Remember what Jesus said? How about this? 
Well, you know, my Jesus is, is just they never, oh, oh, he wouldn't hurt you. He, there wouldn't be nothing said to hurt you if you was going to mate with a worm. Jesus turned and said this about children. He took a child and set him on his knee, brought him in the midst. As he looked at that child, did you not hear it coming up inside him? Because that's the Lord's heritage. He said, anyone who would offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it is better for you. He didn't say this was your punishment. He said, this would be a better punishment that you have a millstone, a millstone, a grinding millstone, tonnage wrapped around your neck. You drown in the depths of the sea than to hurt one of these little who believe in me. He said, their, their angels always behold the face of my Father in heaven. Everything you do is taken note of. Every, every act against them is written down. Everything. You are setting yourself up for a harvest that you cannot win. You think this mess is going to continue in the world. You are wrong. You are wrong. Until the church is taken out of here, we win. And we always win. It's our father's bat, our father's ball, and we play till by God we win. And so in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you something, a word from the Lord today. Church, wise up, wake up, do what's right. I don't know how many more times the Lord, I've never had him just say, go to the church and tell them. Well, I've told it. Now you make your decisions. Make your decisions. What you're going to do. You're going to live righteous? You're going to allow sin in your ranks? What? What? We're having to change a whole insurance company over all the ministry because of the stand they came out and made. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. I've, I've, I've gave the word of the Lord, so it's a good day. Amen. Well, Brother Robin, you know, you didn't sound very anointed. Well, maybe not. But I did give the word of the Lord as a prophet. No prophets were corrupt. Really? Your mamas were snakes. How about that? How about that? John the Baptist did that. Jesus said that. So give these, give these trapped in the lifestyle a chance to live. Show them something in the church that's different than the misery they live in. They're miserable. Show them the truth. They long to somebody to give them an identity. Searching for an identity. Once they find their identity, they have a destiny. Do you want to pastor your whole life, lay down and die one day? You didn't change anything within two blocks of where you live? Is that your goal? That you just made a good living? That you just, that you just were able to, to procure things that you made you and your four no more happy? while thousands around you just groped in the darkness, crawling back like that concubine, trying to find the threshold of the old man's house. Is that what it is? Wake up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, today on the 11th hour, we've given the word of the Lord, and... Uh, Take heed to it. And if those of you out there, pastors that want to get saved, right now, anybody in the five-fold ministry that you want to get born again, let me show you how to do that. 
Scripture says that Paul said, if you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. That if you could uh, uh, confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, you'll be saved. And so, you know, Paul thought he was doing the right thing. And maybe some of you was raised up by delinquent leaders. Maybe some of you were raised up by lying prophets. Like that young man who went to the king and told him the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, don't go back the same way you came. Don't, or don't go eat with that king. You go back. You leave. And another old prophet came out and said, I'm a prophet too. The Lord said, come get you. Lied to that young man. Then when it was over and the young man got through eating, he gave him his dessert after the meal. Because you disobeyed the Lord, a lion will kill you on. You think of that. Don't you know that young man got up knowing my life is over? All because the, the one lied to him. Maybe you've been raised up by lying pastors, prophets, all that. Maybe you've listened to lies long enough. Maybe, just maybe they've been married so many times or have are living in adultery that you're convinced it's okay. Maybe this is what it is. And you know, God forgives anything. And it's not just so much of being somebody married once or twice. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody go and take another man's wife and live in adultery. Maybe you were raised. You know, there's a lot of, there's grounds for divorce. In this. No grounds. There's things that happen in people's lives. God forgives it all, but there's a difference in seeking the Lord and finding the right person and letting him send them and to just go grab someone else's. That's what I'm saying. Amen. Praise God. Well, if you do that, you say, Lord Jesus, come in my heart, be my Lord, personal Savior, and I confess with my mouth that you're Lord. I believe in my heart God raised you from Dead, save me now and show me how to turn this big ship you put, put me over. He'll do it. You'll have a more successful ministry in church than you ever dreamed. Hallelujah. And go ahead and tell the people that are bound up in identity crisis, LGBTQ people, uh, homosexuals, uh, all these kind of transgender. Start telling them there's a real life, real identity for you. Wouldn't you like to have children, grandchildren? Raise them in the admonition of the Lord. Amen. Well, praise God. Come on, Krista, take up the offering today or receive this offering. We're just going to uh, let people give whatever you want to give. People say, well, how much, Brother Robin? Let me tell you something about giving. You be obedient. Your heart. If it's a quarter, 50 cents, or 50,000, makes no difference. As long as you're obedient, it'll be more than enough for you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Nobody knows what it's like to get up and do the offering <laughs> after after a prophet gets finished giving the, the word of the Lord. But where he calls you, he equips you. Praise God. Well, you know, I just kind of want to continue on that same path today and those of you that want ways to give are on the screen and also find at robindeep.com and um, I just want to continue it in that you know the scripture says it says what fellowship hath light with darkness and in I'm also going to read this out of the message translation that's second Corinthians six fourteen, and I've read this before but you know, we, we've read John 3, 16, most of us our whole lives that's been believers, but we still have yet to really scratch the surface of that one scripture and, and everything it entails because it actually entails all of uh, Christianity in one scripture. And it, it's so it's so deep in, in what we believe. So I want to read this again. It says, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of what out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. 
Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are, each of us a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way, I'll live in them, move into them, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise, leave it for good. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me, the word of the master God. So it says, don't don't be partners with evil. Don't be partners with darkness. Most of us wonder why we're not prospering. And why you say we're I'm giving, I'm giving every every offering, I'm tithing, but yet I'm seeing no prosperity as you're telling me this with your Starbucks cup in your hand. You say, well, I don't find I'm I'm not convicted over uh over buying coffee from Starbucks. Number one, there's a pagan goddess above the whole thing. It's their logo. The scripture says, quit setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple. And yet we have churches that in their four years, the, the coffee shop says we proudly brew Starbucks coffee. You have just set a pagan idol up in your church. Then if that's not enough, they publicly came out and made a stand that they will match any funds given to Planned Parenthood by their employees. And they will fly people to get an abortion and take care of all their expenses. This is the coffee, and it's garbage anyways. Don't even taste good. This is the coffee that you're holding in your hands, and then you're wondering, why isn't my giving working? But yet you hold blood coffee in your hands. And you set this crap up in your church. And that's the first thing people come in and they see and they stand in line to pay for it before they ever give their offering in church. This is garbage. Absolute garbage. There's more coffee companies. And if that's not enough, did you know they're anti-Semitic? Did you know they don't like the Jews? And if that's not enough, they do not like the veterans of our United States military, and they will not support them. That was enough right there to make me quit buying from them, and that's the reason I quit buying coffee from them to begin with, was because they made the stand about veterans. They said that they wouldn't hire them. That was enough. Then they made a statement about the Jews when the guy who started Starbucks was Jewish. Started it. But, that, but I'm sure it's changed hands now along the way, but they don't like the Jews. All right, that's enough. Check that off my list. That's garbage. Then we go home and we entertain ourselves with TV and nobody watches real TV anymore. Nobody watch. everybody, the majority of people have apps you watch. And we have these partnerships coming out of our account every month. Let me tell you something about, you know, I, I, was, I was actually rooting for Disney behind the scenes, try, hoping for righteousness to come in. I was really, why? Because we've got to root for them. We've got to, we need people of righteousness in these places. We, we do. But then it comes out. I saw somebody post it, so I fact-checked it myself because I thought, is this just, uh, you know, people just jumping on a bashing bandwagon until I realized it was, in fact, true. There is a show. 
that Disney Plus has just green-lighted, and it's made by a German film company, and the title of it is called Pauline. Pauline is an 18-year-old girl who is trying to navigate life. She's, at, she's going to college. She's a freshman in college. She's trying to find her identity and destiny and all of this. And, and so upon that, those struggles and the frustrations of life, she finds herself having a one-night stand with a boy named Lucas. And guess what? She gets pregnant. So if that's not enough... She finds out that who she's pregnant by is actually Satan himself. And they have green-lighted. This is a live-action show. This is not a cartoon. This is not the little demon. This is an, a live-action show called Pauline. And it's a real show that they have green-lighted to, to set in motion. And the German film company says this is passion project a passion project and your 1099 1599 whatever a month that you pay goes to help fund that trash it helps fund it you say well that's what my kids watch turn on veggie tales turn on veggie tales turn on the super book turn on something there is plenty. Yeah, well, go watch Adventure Camp from Church International with the puppets, Landon and Billy Bob Joe. Let them, you know what? I never watched a secular TV show until I was almost double digits. And at the time, sure, I thought I'm missing out on something. I look back now and I think, thank God that as my brain was developing, that these were the things that I was taking in. Why? Because I had parents that would stand up and say, you're not watching that garbage and you're not bringing that into our house. And these are the things that we are partnering up with because we have this, like he was talking about, this justification around it. We think just because we go to church and we worship God on Sundays and we watch something that's not that bad, then we're okay. But yet you could be watching the most innocent cartoon on Disney+. Plus. You could be watching Air Bud. You could be watching something that innocent. But yet the money that you pay to them every month partners to put that kind of trash on TV. So the next time you go to get in the line to get some coffee, I want you to think about what you're sowing into. And don't ever let it come out of your mouth again that all Christians want is money. And that all the church wants is money. And that prosperity preachers. You say, you're just a prosperity preacher. Well, if the opposite is a poverty preacher, go ahead, slap that title on. Because prosperity is more than just money. It's spiritual, it's physical, and it's financial. So, yeah, I'm proud to be. Because I want to see the body of Christ prosper. But we'll never prosper holding hands with the darkness. You'll never prosper. That scripture, you should answer the question. It says, does Christ go strolling with the devil? And if the answer is no, well, then that should be your answer. Go strolling in the park with. So, why don't you just make a stand and cut all this mess out? Cut it out. Just say, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Repent for what you have sewn into it repent plead the blood over it some people do it ignorant do you know some people watching have probably never heard that that that's what these people stand for some people have done it ignorant all you got to do is just he will forgive you or willing to ask forgiveness because he he went ahead and, and paid that price so just repent over that 
and then just like that song today, awake, 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 it's time to go forth. So now that you are awake to that, now that that has become real to you, now you are responsible for what you do from this point on. You're not in ignorance anymore when you go and drink that coffee. You're not in ignorance anymore. It's time we take a stand, my brother and sister, because if we don't take a stand, if we don't use our, if we don't use the prosperity that God has given us to make programs and put the message out there, well, Disney Plus will sure give a message. And they'll say, it's okay to sleep with Satan and birth that seed. And that's, that, you said, that sounds harsh, but that's the message. And they know what they're doing. They're not doing it out of ignorance. So you know what? We know what we're doing, too. We know that we're ripping the, the cover off those frauds and exposing them, sham that they are. And this is what... This is what keeps all of all of this going. This is what keeps your programs going. This is what keeps you moving and preaching the gospel to every creature. We're occupying space. Because if we don't occupy it, somebody else will. So today, I want you to remember that as you give today. You say, well, that, that's harsh. Well, sometimes the truth is harsh. But I say it to you in love. Because I want to see you prosper, and I want to see your children prosper spiritually, physically, and financially. Because we've got a job to do. And we're, we're glory carriers. The glory lives within us. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, it lives within you. And he made a promise to Moses, he said, my glory will fill this earth. Guess who's supposed to carry that glory around? We are. We're the glory carriers. And it's going to take all of us being prosperous. Amen. Amen. Well, as you give today, I want to pray Luke 638 over you. It says, as I give, say it, give, and it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto my bosom. For with the same measure that I meet with all, it shall be measured to me again. You say, I believe it. I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, Malachi 3.10, this is your promise. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, in Jesus' name, amen, so be it. Roxanne, we got some praise reports today? Praise God. Yes, praise the Lord. It's even harder after that to get up. <laughs> Let's rejoice. <laughs> So, we um, all of these today I'm reading, they are partners with the 11th Hour, partners with CI. We had five or six pages of praise reports come in just this week. So, I want to read to you a couple of these about what the Lord is doing in our partners' lives. This one says, um, we had an F3 tornado hit our little town, and much of it was destroyed. I anointed the doors to my home with oil on the first warning, and I stood in my basement and declared the 91st Psalm, and commanded by the blood of Jesus it couldn't touch anything that belonged to me and my family. We only lost power and had no destruction come to our property. Praise God. And they said, thank you, because God is absolutely good. Amen. This one says, I want to testify on God being absolutely good. I was diagnosed with collapsed kidneys, very high blood pressure, and congestive heart failure. Well, about a week ago, my heart test results came back, and the doctor said my heart was beating normally. And other than a small blockage that was treated with medication, 
Uh, my heart, all the blood in my heart was flowing normally. And I just received my kidney ultrasound uh, results the other day, and the doctor said that my kidneys now look normal. Praise the Lord. I had to leave my job due to these medical issues and thus affecting my tithing ability, but I have tithed on any money I've received, and praise the Lord, I'm healed. So hallelujah. That's amazing. My goodness. Uh, let's see. Um, this one... Um, said, I need to send along a thank you for healing that was called out by Prophet Robin many months ago. He called out healing of the tendons in the knees, and I claimed that healing for a pain and misalignment of the tendons on my left knee that had been an issue since 2014. I had gone through two sessions of physical therapy over those years, and it didn't fix anything. My knee was fixed the next day after that healing was called out. And she said, I praise God for healing me and send many thanks to the ministry. So praise the Lord. This one was just the other day. Uh, one of our partners was at Evangel World Prayer Service when the 11th Hour team was there um, the other night. And she said, uh, my tithe last night was $80, and I opened the mailbox today to a check of $844. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We thank you so much for sending your praise reports in. If, please share with us what God's doing in your life. Send them to robindbullock.com. You can click on the links there to share what God has done for you all around the world. And take time today to find something to rejoice about. If you say I don't have anything, take a deep breath in and praise the Lord when you let it out. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today on on uh, all the way around, you know, you know, people think, well, well, you know, sometimes prophets give hard words. You know, here's the thing. You can look at the motive. When John the Baptist looked at the, the religious people that came to challenge him, if you, if, yeah, he said your, your mothers are snakes and so forth. But if you'll look at the motive, listen to what he said. He said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who has warned you? In other words, John was saying nobody's even bothered to warn you. Nobody's even bothered to tell you anything about the wrath that's coming so that you could escape it. Nobody. He said, in other words, so I'm telling you. I'm telling you so you can flee from the coming wrath. You know, Jesus Jesus told them that you're, you're a generation of vipers and so forth. And then when you start listening at all the things, he said, you, you scour the countryside and you make a, a proselyte finally and you make him twice the child of hell than you are. And he just talks like that. And then if you start really reading and just keep reading what he's saying, you come to a part eventually where he says, how can you escape hell? His whole motive was to, to bring it to their eyes where they wouldn't go to hell. That's his whole motive. He wanted them to live. John the Baptist said, who warned you? Nobody's even tried to warn you. Maybe nobody even has the nerve to stand up and tell a pastor. Do you know they're doing that in your staff? Do you know that that man over there has his ex-wife living right across the hall from him and his wife? Do you know their bedrooms are almost just in front of each other? Do you know this is going on? Do you know that they're doing this or, or and whatever? And nobody sometimes will dare even tell the leader. You know, there was a situation where a realtor that we, that's uh, like a member of our family, went to this place and, and you know, she's a top seller. In real, in real estate, and the Lord has just blessed her and her family. and Just a really top award-winning realtor. And, and the, so they were attended this gathering where they're going to pass out this, oh, these awards. And so at the last minute, they said it was at the last minute, the leadership, suddenly they have these showgirls, or however they described them, at the front entrance, welcoming them. But when they get in there, they bring a fortune teller out on stage with a crystal ball and all this kind of stuff and uh, forecasting the future of the realtor. Well, this realtor that 
that's we know that was the last straw for her. That I'm not doing this. This is not okay with me. So she prayed, and the Lord brought the regional directors into a local office, and they came right to her over this one big sale. She, they came right to her and said, uh, you know, ask her about that. And then she got to tell them about all this stuff. And this man always gets up and talks about the Lord, how God saved him, how he did this. And she looked at him and told him, said, this is not okay. This is witchcraft. This is, and, and this was his response. You know, sometimes we can grow so fast, we lose sight of what, what's right. There was no word, I'll fix it, or I apologize. I'll never ha- that'll never happen again. See, sometimes people don't have the nerve. They didn't have the nerve to tell the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees what was wrong, but John the Baptist did. A prophet's ministry is part of that. To say, who's warned you? But hear the motive. Who's warned you? Nobody's warned you. So I'm warning you from the coming wrath. Jesus said, I don't want you to go to hell because hell is a very long time. It's a never-ending place. So today, the Lord said, tell you about the, the story in Judges 19, 21. Chapters 19 through 21 about that. And you can see, can you not see it's an exact parallel even down to gender identity? Everything. And so, who has warned you of that? I don't know. Maybe you've never heard that before. But I'm telling you, get it right. Get it right because it's about to stop. A lot of things are about to end. You may not have the ministry today. Uh, tomorrow you have today. Stop. So stop it. So this is the word of the Lord for the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wake, awake. It's time to move forward. Praise God. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want to tell you this, though. Tonight, tune in to Church International Prayer Service tonight. Uh, Tune in there and chat in with Johnny and Chrissy and tell them your prayer request. It's an international stream where where people uh, chat in from all over, and they send their prayer request in, and, and we're about to enlarge it even farther so tonight it happens at seven central time on the church international youtube channel or i guess it is it on the uh website too yes or you can go to churchint.org you can watch it there too and participate but but you need to be a part of that if you have something you want prayer did some of those prayer requests come from that from any of those they were telling me about one that's absolutely amazing and uh, that that was answered from that from that place and tonight live at church international here in warrior alabama will be a live prayer service if you want to attend that prayers going on everywhere tonight here i mean i'll be praying over our partners the live prayer service at at church international and warrior Plus, the international prayer stream will be happening tonight. So there's a lot going on. We want to see your prayers answered. Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom. Shalom.